Three years ago, I found myself at the top of a Himalayan mountain with a bunch of brainwave sensing equipment in my backpack, searching for meditating monks. So it's times like this that you have to take a step back from life and ask yourself, how exactly did I end up here? Um, my story started in neuroscience labs in the United States, studying how the brain changes during meditation, both structurally and functionally. Um, and one natural question might be, why is it that we might expect the brain to change during meditation, and what is meditation? So it turns out that the brain changes over both the short and the long term through repeated activities. So for example, if you take brain, scan brain scans of people who are just learning to juggle, and you look at them over the course of weeks and months, you can actually see areas of their brain um, for example, areas that perceive motion change over, these, over the course of training. So that whole concept is kind of called neuroplasticity, and that's actually the basis for how meditation works as well. So what is meditation? Meditation is basically the repeated bringing back of attention to a particular object. So that might be paying attention to your breath and the sensation of your breath going in and out of your nostrils. Or it could even be a feeling. For example, the feeling of compassion. You can try it yourself as you're sitting here. Um, what does it feel like somatically in your own body to feel compassion, to feel kindness? Um, that can actually be a meditation. And it turns out that sort of sounds like hippy dippy stuff, but actually um, uh, studies have looked at monks, Tibetan monks, who have more than 10,000 hours of practice in this type of meditation, compassion meditation. And what you can see here is that their brains are dramatically different during this course of meditation. So what you're seeing is before the red line, the monk is simply resting. And then after the red line, the monk is asked to meditate on the idea of compassion. And you can see that the brain waves look completely different. This is stuff that has not been seen in Western science before. And it's the result of neuroplasticity and kind of repeated training. It's really amazing stuff. So you might think that these changes are kind of relegated to people like monks, people who go off into the mountains and practice meditation um, for years and years, but that's actually not the case. This is a really exciting study that was done just a few years ago that looked at people that had never done meditation before. So they enrolled them in an eight-week course, just 30 minutes on average of meditation every day, and it turns out that areas in their brain actually change, areas associated with sense of self and empathy. So this is kind of a sign that all of us are actually able to change our brains through something as simple as meditation. But what does it actually mean for your brain to change? What, what does that actually mean in our day-to-day -day lives? It turns out that there have now been hundreds of studies looking at mindfulness and meditation. And it turns out that there are incredible benefits that you can kind of actualize in your own life through meditation. Some of those include an increased ability to pay attention an increased ability to have empathy with other people, to look at someone's face and to understand what they're feeling. More than that, and maybe more exciting, is that meditation seems to leave people with a sense of increased well-being and happiness. And that's something that we all, we all are looking for in life. And so it's, it's really exciting to see these studies kind of validate um, this, this very simple practice that we can all do. More than that, meditation allows you to combat things and, offer, and kind of get relief from things like anxiety and stress. And for that reason, it's now offered in more than 250 hospitals across the United States and elsewhere um, for things like stress reduction um, and lowering of high blood pressure and other things associated with stress. So as a researcher and a scientist, um, we study things from the third person perspective. Um, and I through studying meditation, gained a real appreciation for what mental training can do to change your, change your mind and also change your life. But uh, there's a difference between um, 
between knowing something intellectually and actually feeling it, actually living it. And I was completely stressed. You know, although we were studying these monks who were so calm and happy, um, I didn't feel that way. And I came to a point in my life where I decided um, that if I really believed that meditation could make my life better, it could make me healthier, it could make me happier, then I had to learn it. I had to do it. And so I quit my job and I started a journey through the Himalayan mountains for almost nine months, searching for these monks that we'd studied in the lab, going from ashram to ashram and monastery to monastery, um, seeking out their wisdom on, about how to meditate. And of course, um, old habits die hard, so I took along uh, a bunch of brain sensing equipment with me in my backpack to see what their <laughs> brains look like. And so these are some of the people that I met. These are amazing people. Um, and I'm just incredibly grateful that they were willing to put on this weird device, number one, but also to be open about um, their practice and, and how, how to meditate, really. Um, this gentleman I met in North India, and when I met him um, at an ashram there, he had like five or six kids crawling all over him like he was a human jungle gym. Um, just a, a very kind person, and as I got to know him, and uh, after we meditated together, he mentioned casually in conversation that he had meditated alone in a cave for like six years. Just like crazy stuff. You don't hear this at dinner conversation very often. Really interesting people. Um, this monk I met in Ladakh, which is a very isolated region in northern India, um, in the desert Himalayas. And um, it's actually very difficult to get to this region. Um, for a long time, it was only accessible for a few months of the year. Um, during which these high altitude ro roads that actually go in are unfrozen. Usually, for most of the year, it's covered by glaciers. And so this incredibly isolated place um, has a lot of monasteries and a lot of monks live there. And this is one of the monks um, who I met. And I could tell you stories um, for hours about these people, incredibly kind. But I hope that as you, as you look at them, you can get an intuitive sense for what a lot of meditation actually does to, to people. Uh, these people are just really, really nice and it shows on their face. So in the end, we collected brainwaves, meditating brainwaves from more than 30 monks and long-term meditators. Um, and we used that to find a signature for what meditation looks like in the brain. Um, but not only that, we also looked at uh, novice meditators, high-powered lawyers, um, startup CEOs. And uh, we, put, we put the headset um, on our girlfriends as well, although they were a little skeptical of the whole project. Um, and in the end, we, uh, I came back to India, and some friends and I decided that we should try to find a way to take everything that we learned about meditation and brainwaves and put it on our smartphones that we carry around with us everywhere. And so we created something called BrainBot, which is essentially a brainwave sensing headset that sends your brainwaves via Bluetooth to a smartphone. And then the smartphone can act as sort of a very intuitive meditation instructor who knows what you're thinking even before you do and can guide you through meditation. So this is just a short example uh, that we put together last year to show you what you can do with this kind of technology. So one thing that beginning meditators often run into is that you're sitting there, you're trying to meditate on compassion or your breath, and your mind starts to wander. You're thinking about what you have to do tomorrow, what you didn't do today. Um, and you're not in the moment, which is which is the idea behind meditation, to keep your attention sustained. Notice what's happening. Relax and gently reconnect with your breath. So we can actually detect in real time with a sensor your level of mindfulness. And as your mind starts to wander, we can give you gentle audio feedback cues to bring you back to your meditation. And hopefully the idea is that this technology can make it easier um, to both learn and sustain a meditation practice. So that's, that's really amazing stuff. And, um, and it seems that uh, this tool, BrainBot, and a whole bunch of tools which are now coming out in the same space um, are all part of this new wave called awareness technologies. And awareness tech is really interesting because it's the synthesis between East and West. It's the bringing together of sort of the material external world and the internal world. An ancient philosopher, a rather a more modern philosopher in India, named Vivekananda, once said that, um, and I'll paraphrase, 
the more that you try to understand the universe, either by looking outward or by looking inward, the more that those two worlds actually come together. And awareness technology is the fulfillment of that promise because it uses external technology to open a window into the true final frontier, which is the human mind. So you can argue that meditation is actually the world's first awareness technology. And we know now through scientific studies that meditation has all kinds of health benefits. It can make you healthier and it can also make you happier. But that's actually not the most exciting part about awareness technology. What you're seeing on the screen, or we're seeing just moments ago, is a visualization of the world's Facebook connections, ties between friends, between family members, um, between loved ones. And uh, as you can see, there are no boundaries between countries. We're all connected in some way. We know from psychological research that happiness can spread through these networks, almost like a cold, from one person to the next. And so the true revolutionary aspect of awareness technology is not only to make ourselves happier, but to in turn spread that to maybe five friends, who in turn spread it to five more. And through this process, we're able to actually, maybe in some small way, make the world a little bit happier and a little bit more peaceful. And I think that's an idea worth spreading. Thank you.